You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Sam Bowman, Executive Director of the Adam Smith Institute. Sam, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. So we're recording this on June 25th, 2016, just two days after Britain voted to leave the European Union. I don't usually cover current events on this show, but this one is too important to pass up. So before we get started with our discussion of Brexit, let's assume that I've been living on the opposite side of the globe from where all this is happening, and I haven't been following European politics at all since, say, the end of the Cold War. So what is the European Union, and what do I need to know about it? Well, the European Union is a collection of states in Europe, as you as you may gather, mm-hmm. um, that initially began in the 1950s as a sort of free trade area. Um, but it was designed always to be more than just a free trade zone. Um, we usually, when we talk about free trade areas, what we're talking about is um, getting rid of tariffs, uh, of course, and then po- possibly some kind of agreement about uh, regulations, um, to countries agreeing not to use regulations to effectively keep out goods from other countries. So it was always designed as a very deep version of a free trade agreement in that in that sense. But it was also always designed to lead to economic and, and political integration. And it's that political integration that's always been the kind of sticking point for the UK. So over the years, it, it evolved and kind of grew closer and closer together um, it, it began as a, a thing called the kind of coal and steel community. It then became the European economic community. And now, uh, since the 1990s, it's been called the European Union. And always the architects of the European Union, as we'll call it, um, dreamed of a, um, a, a kind of an ever closer union, one that eventually would be a, a single federal state. Um, now, the UK has always been a sort of red-headed stepchild in all of this. Even when it joined in 1973, it joined later than most of the other major countries in, the, in, the, in Western Europe because uh, the French had blocked the UK, uh, sort of knowing that the UK would be, that would be a sort of blo- a barrier to this political integration. And the UK has always wanted the European Union to be a, a purely economic project. So um, what has happened since the 1990s is that um, as the free movement of labor has become more and more of a live issue um, when since, since the kind of poorer countries in Eastern Europe have joined and there has been a huge opportunity for people to migrate for from poor countries like Poland to relatively rich countries like England, um, that has made the European Union more and more of a kind of live issue in domestic British politics and ultimately that's led to what's happened this week. I'm actually reminded of... Uh during the Roman Empire, the the Brits would constantly be launching re- revolts, and whoever was running Britain would <laughs> name themselves emperor. It's it's like nothing has changed. Absolutely, yeah, and to some extent, um, it's it's easy to over over um, exaggerate how uh, how unique the UK was. You know, there are some countries in in Europe that would also like it to be really just a market. Um, Most of the Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Denmark uh, and Finland um, really don't like the political integration aspects of the European Union. They're really much closer to the UK. Um, uh, The Netherlands, even though the Netherlands was one of the founding members of the of the European Union, uh, it is it has become increasingly sceptical about the political project of the European Union. And we have to remember that um, in the 2000s, uh, the big shock to the system was that the European um, uh, Constitution, which was supposed to sort of lay the groundwork for a sort of 21st century European Union, was rejected by both Dutch voters. Uh, which wasn't a huge shock, but it was still a pretty big shock. But astonishingly, by French voters, and this was sort of a this this sort of sent um, this was an earthquake really in uh, European Union politics. Um, where I'm from, Ireland, and um, repeatedly voted down treaties I- in the 2000s, and so across the European Union, it's not just the British government. Um, anymore that's sort of skeptical about the, the political side of this project and it has to be said the economic side of this project um but certainly the uk has always sort of led the way on this 
So the EU consists of this free trade zone, which includes free movement of labor, so free migration. Uh, but it also consists of uh, a currency union, the euro, which Britain was never a part of, but most of the other countries are. And, Correct. And uh, it's also got a regulatory body, as I understand it, in Brussels that I think a sticking point for a lot of people was that this body isn't democratically elected and so feels kind of uh, separate and uh, maybe unfair. Correct. The, the, the commission, the European Commission, is the, the real um, kind of nerve center of the European Union. Its members are appointed by uh, the governments of the European Union. Um, all of the big countries get to appoint one commissioner, and then um, the smaller countries sort of rotates between them um, every kind of session. Uh, so Ireland gets to appoint a commissioner this time round, and the next time round we won't, but Malta will say will. And each of those commissioners is then given a special brief um, responsibility for trade, for example, responsibility for financial services, banking, things like that. And um, there's been a lot of anger that somebody appointed by the French government, for example, or by the German government, has. Um, or, or let's let's take a let's take a, a real issue. Uh, somebody appointed by the Swedish government is responsible for our kind of international trade negotiations. So that kind of democratic unaccountability has been a real sticking point. Now there is actually a parliament. In the European, in the European Union, the European Parliament, and it's it's voted on by by everybody. Um, you know, we I have a I have members of European Parliament in where I live, and I I didn't actually vote that time round, but <laughs> if I wanted to, I could. Um, but the Parliament is very weak compared to the Commission. All the Parliament can do is block um, proposals that the Commission makes. It can't propose things of its own. And even though you might think, okay, well then to make the EU more democratic, we should give the Parliament more power. Um, that is something that people who are worried about sort of independence worry about a lot because for them they're sort of caught in a, in a catch-22 situation. The more democratic you make the EU, the less um, power they feel the national member states have and the more power is sort of ceded away to the EU. So it's a trade-off between sort of sovereignty and democracy, um, both of which are very important to a lot of people. Okay, so if the power of the European Parliament were expanded, then Europe would essentially become the United States of Europe, it sounds like. Correct, correct. Not just that, but yeah, that would be one of the kind of key points that would strengthen the EU compared to its member states, which is, we have to remember, is one of the explicit goals of the European Union. Um, what, what then kind of changed in the last six months is that um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, um, who uh, effectively said, I'm going to try and renegotiate. I want to reform the European Union. And I want to get all of these changes that we want, one of which was uh, an agreement that ever closer union, this this kind of part of the founding documents of the EU, wouldn't apply to the UK. So if there were legal cases where um, there was sort of some dispute about where the power should lay, this uh, the text in the documents that, that sort of that implied that the UK was signed up to an ever closer union project would no longer apply. Now that um, was seen as being a, a bit of a kind of an empty promise or an empty an empty victory. So it didn't have that much, that much influence on the campaign, but it certainly was something that he tried to do. So tell me about this campaign. Why did some people want to leave? So I think the the biggest reasons for leaving um, to do with the EU. The biggest one has to be freedom of movement. Um, freedom of movement has always been one of the kind of main goals of the EU, and it's since 1993 always been it's been one of the kind of founding points of the EU. But it was only uh, since 2004 when uh, this group of eight Eastern European former Soviet countries joined the European Union, um, countries like Lithuania, Poland, Estonia, and so on. And it was only at that point that economic migration became such an important issue. And to add to that. Most of the European Union states put in short-term, they were allowed to by the EU, put in short-term work uh, blocks. So effectively, they gave themselves a six or seven year um, kind of breathing space where freedom of movement didn't apply to these new countries. But the UK was not one of those countries. So the UK, which had a pretty healthy economy for, throughout that period, and even after the recession, the, the Great Recession in 2008, the UK 
um, in terms of jobs, recovered quite quickly. And the UK has had very, very strong job growth over the last five years, even if it hasn't had very strong productivity or economic growth. Um, and all of that has made the UK not just the only country, the only large country that these Eastern European markets can go to, but also a very attractive country to go to, as the rest of Europe is kind of economically stagnant. Um, so that's been the that's been I think it's it's fair to say one of the kind of major drivers and certainly explains why we saw such strong working class support for leaving the EU. That was the real shock to everybody that the working class voters who usually don't turn out in such large numbers really did come out in large numbers. And it's a similar phenomenon. Um, and I don't mean this to uh, attack the Leave campaign, but it's a similar sort of group of people that perhaps are voting for Trump in the United States it's, uh, with similar concerns. Now, the other um, side of that is um, older voters who are probably more affluent, who generally vote conservative, um, who have a more old-fashioned, I guess, um, and a more abstract opposition to the EU, which is this idea of sovereignty, this idea of kind of independence. The EU, under this idea of kind of ever closer union, doesn't ju- isn't just about this market. It's also about uh, uh, common trade policy, common foreign policy. Um, it has some say over kind of justice issues. Uh, it's 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 really sort of stepped beyond. Um, what many in the UK kind of wish it was. Um, And I think that it's that combination of working class concern about globalization and immigration combined with more affluent middle class voters worried about um, the UK just being part of a super state coming together and then ultimately adding up to this 52% that we've had to leave. Yeah, you you mentioned the uh, the shock that the leave vote succeeded. I um, people were talking about how the the pollsters really got this wrong and the prediction markets were even saying that it was you know i i think i saw as low as like 15 percent chance that that yeah. uh, leave would succeed and it did so uh yeah could you could you explain a little about why they got it so wrong well i, I don't really think we know why they got it so wrong um the throughout the uh, campaign phone polls where, where people just ring you up on, on the telephone uh, showed a very consistent lead for staying, whereas online polls were always much closer. And the question there was, which of these are more representative? Um, online polls perhaps attract sort of more um, engaged and, and energetic voters, so maybe they're maybe they're skewed in that re- in that respect. Phone polls perhaps get people who are at home during the day, who um, you know, or people who are less busy with their time, so they're more willing to talk to a pollster. So there are all these different biases running in every direction. Now, phone polls were more accurate, but on the day of the referendum, all of the polls, uh, except for two, um, eight out of ten of the major polls said that it was going to be a remain. So this uh, was, was the first point. The second was that um, hedge funds did um, private polling, um, did what's called an exit poll, where you ask people as they're actually coming out of the voting booth, how did you vote? Um, and they did this private polling. And throughout the day, we saw the pound strengthening and uh, the stock market uh, it, it stre- uh, growing, all of which sort of suggested that these he- these polls, which weren't public, nobody knew what they said, but everybody kind of was was deducing from from these rises that the polls were implying a strong Remain vote. Now, what may have happened is that these polls were all wrong because nobody expected turnout to be so high. And turnout being very high, particularly turnout among the working class, was something that nobody, I don't think anybody really expected it to be as high as it was. And that, I think, perhaps is one of the reasons that they were all skewed. Now, to me, um, I'm, a, I'm a kind of efficient markets type, um, type of economist. Um, mm-hmm. Betting markets are always what you should really look at. And betting markets were always pretty, uh, pretty convinced, you know, 60, 70 percent probability that will remain. Um, but what really, really shakes my confidence in, in betting markets is that not just on the day did we see this very, very clear tightening towards lead, which turned out to be, uh, sorry, towards remain, which turned out to be wrong. Um, at one point in the day, you could have got 15 to 1 odds uh, that the UK would leave. So, you know, that's a very, very big, um, big, big, big mistake, I guess, on the part of betting markets. You, you mean that it the, would the remain? Re- uh. 15 to 1 odds that we would leave. So if you put down £10, you would make £150 profit that, oh. uh, for the result For the result that eventually turned out to be correct. So betting markets really got this one wrong on the day. But even worse than that, 
during the night as the returns were coming in, and it became increasingly clear betting markets didn't move. And I made um, £230. Uh, I, I more than doubled my money on the night. And I'm, I'm a bit of a, a political gambler, but I'm not, I wasn't gambling on this because I didn't feel like I had any special knowledge or any special judgment. Um, but betting markets got it unbelievably wrong. And even when everybody else realized, and it was completely clear, I think, to everybody that um, Leave was going to win this based on the returns that we were getting from kind of bellwether uh, cities, Uh, betting markets still didn't move and it took them a long time to do it. So it's a very, very strange thing that I don't fully understand. I think the, the, um, behavior on the night, we, I, I think is very difficult to understand. The behavior, um, beforehand, we could say is that even if a betting market, um, predicts a 10% chance of something happening, that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. You know, if I roll a dice, Mm -hmm. Then if I roll a die, then there's an 83% chance that I'll get something other than a six. If I roll a six, that doesn't mean that the probabilities are wrong. It just means that that set, that 17% thing has a, has happened. You know, a, a low probability event can happen. So it's possible that based on all the information that we had, it's uh, leave was just unpredictable, and we just could not have known that leave was going to happen. In that case, what we're just trying to do is um, understand why they behaved so strangely on the night itself. Yeah, yeah. I I also usually put a lot of confidence in betting markets, and I'm surprised that they didn't update as the results ca- came in and start to swing sooner. Um, but mo- moving to uh, the, I guess, the political situation. You know, now that Britain has voted to leave, what happens? What are what are its options going forward? So this is the thing I'm really interested in because there. There are basically lots of different kinds of free trade agreement that we could have. Um, everybody agrees that we want some kind of uh, trade agreement with the EU, um, even if it's uh, a trade agreement sort of that goes through the World Trade Organization's rules, the sort of lowest common denominator for a uh, free trade agreement. Everybody wants something like that. Now, apart from that, which which really wouldn't be that good, um, it wouldn't give us any kind of agreement about not using regulations to keep out goods, which which can be a much, much more important thing than tariffs. It also would actually allow the UK or the EU to impose tariffs of up to 4% on goods on, on one side or the other. So that's really not that good of a free trade agreement. Apart from that, one thing that we could do that um, the Germans are sort of suggesting they might push for is, and remember that Germany is very influential in the EU, so this is important, is something like what, they, what uh, Turkey has, which is some kind of cooperation on regulation in some respects, um, but really in terms of manufacturing goods, quite quite a lot of free trade but in terms of services so things like banking um all the all the sorts of services that the uk economy relies on no real cooperation at all now that would be a real problem because eight out of ten jobs in the uk are uh, services based jobs and um the the real kind of attractive um thing about the eu has always been that it's been much easier it's much easier for uh for, for example a law firm to provide legal services outside the UK within the EU under the single market rules um, because they, they harmonize lots of the sort of legal rules and things like that. So some people, and I'm one of them, are hoping that what we get is something that's called the EEA option, which is the European Economic Area option. Now, this is what Norway and Iceland both have. And they're outside the EU, but they are within the single market. So they have to adopt quite a few, you know, quite, you know, something like 20 or 30 percent of the EU's laws to do with product regulation, health and safety, things like that. But in exchange, and they also have to pay in money to the EU to kind of pay to, to access the market in this way. But in exchange for that, they get full access to the European Union market as if they were members of the European Union. So they get all of the the sort of economic benefits and all of the market participation, but they don't have things like the common tariffs that the EU has the the keep out sort of goods from outside the EU. They don't have the common security policy, the common foreign policy, and there, if more things come about within the EU, like uh, deeper sort of controls over what national governments can do when it comes to spending and things like that, which maybe um, the European Union thinks they need to make the euro work, the euro currency work, they don't apply to Norway or Iceland. So the UK, I believe, probably could uh, push for this. And because it's already in place with other countries, I suspect we could probably get it. Now, what's the big problem with that? 
the first is, of course, we'd have to pay money in. I, I don't. We'd be, we'd be paying less in. I don't really think that that's a, a kind of a major issue, although it probably would be. The other is that we'd have to adopt a lot of these regulations. Well, that's a fair point, but on the other hand, we would also um, be the, the costs of adopting those regulations would probably be offset by the benefits of being able to for UK sellers to be able to sell in sell products in France as if it was part of the UK. It's a very very integrated market. But the big cost um, that many regard as a cost is that we would have to maintain freedom of movement. So this big live issue that people really really cared about. Um, of Eastern European immigrants coming to the UK would still be there. And many people, I think, would feel betrayed about that. The question then is, how do we, how do we A, can we, can we deal with that? Can we kind of sell them on this? Um, or B, does it matter? Yeah. Um, the Leave group had 52% of the population, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a coalition that is big enough for them Absolutely. to start setting policy. So, Exactly, exactly. I think that's the key point. A lot of people at the moment, because we don't have referendums very often in the UK, this is only, I believe, this is only the second nationwide referendum ever. Um, I, I, I might be wrong, there might have been a third, but this is, um, this is a very unusual thing for us to have. And people, I think, aren't really that good at interpreting what they, what they mean. Legally speaking, the only thing that we have that we're, we have voted on, and this isn't even legally binding. Parliament, if it wanted to, could legally just say we're ignoring this referendum. Um, but I think that would be very, very that's very unlikely. But the only thing that was on that ballot paper was this question of should we be a member of the EU or should we not be a member of the EU? And there are people who voted for that, of course, because they don't like immigrants and they don't like immigration. But there are lots of people who are kind of liberal, sort of more liberal, libertarian leave type people who cared about sovereignty and also are worried about the, the economic prospects of, of the UK outside the European single market. So I think that it's very possible that when we add the um, people who wanted to remain in the EU, mostly for economic reasons, with the people who wanted to leave the EU but didn't really want to leave the single market and don't mind that much about Polish people coming and working here, then it, we may very well have a workable kind of coalition of support um, for something like this kind of EEA deal. We're already beginning to see some of the key um, political leaders of the Leave campaign, the sort of more libertarian conservative types coming out and saying effectively, you know, they're, they're using kind of veiled language, but effectively saying that this is what they would like. So I think that um, we probably will get this. The downside, of course, is that those voters who did vote for leave purely on an immigration, on anti-immigration basis will feel very betrayed. And people are concerned that they will then go and vote for um, some of the more populist parties like UKIP. Yeah. Um, so the, oh, is Switzerland part of the EEA? I don't know if you mentioned that one. Switzerland is not part of the EEA. Switzerland actually has um, hundreds of, or dozens at least, um, over a hundred bilateral treaties with the European Union, each for separate parts of the of its economy. Now, it's possible that the Swiss deal it, it also has free, free freedom of movement. Although there was a referendum that kind of said we want to get rid of freedom of movement, so they have to renegotiate that. Um, but it's possible that the Swiss deal might be the ultimate goal for the UK. Not not exactly what, Swi what Switzerland has, because we don't make watches uh, as much as Switzerland does, for example. Um, so that sector isn't very important to us. But it's possible that what the UK really needs is a very, very um, unique, bespoke deal that um, is extremely detailed and kind of sets out in very, very specific detail in a per sector, per industry basis, what the rules of the game are. Um, in every respect. But there's no way that we will get that in the two-year period that we have to negotiate. Legally, we're out two years after um, we sort of trigger the beginnings of these negotiations, which will that trigger will probably come sometime towards the end of the year when we have a new prime minister. But um, it could be that this is the ultimate goal. And in that case, the EEA option basically gives us a five or 10 year sort of breathing buffer zone where the economics doesn't change very much, where everything really stays the same, although we're politically outside the EU. And then we can take that time to come up with a more detailed agreement, a kind of unique British deal rather than a Norway deal. Um, I th I've heard that. I think that's quite an attractive option. Um, I'm a bit wary of political, the, the politics of kind of coming out and saying that because it's the sort of thing that right now 
the EU will just say, no, we're never going to do that. We, they, they're really worried about other countries leaving um, if the UK gets a good deal. And um, that, that's something that I think pushes against the sort of best case deal scenario. Yeah, the, the EEA option sounds like you get a lot of the good of the EU and and actually get rid of a lot of the, the negative aspects. But, you know, if if it's so great, why is the stock market way down? Well, absolutely, absolutely. The The stock market is, um, is has fallen very, very significantly by about 7% if you look at the what I think is the best me- measure of um, UK firms, the FTSE 250. Um, some people have said the FTSE 100, they've pointed out that the FTSE 100 hasn't dropped that much, but most FTSE 100 revenues come from overseas. 70% of their revenues come from overseas. So the massive drop in the pound um, sort of alleviates that for them. FTSE 200, 250 is a better measure. So one reason for this may be that the stock market doesn't know what how good this deal is or how good a deal we're going to get. And they're pricing in the danger of us getting a Turkish-style deal or even a World Trade Organization-style deal um, in, into, their, into their pricing of assets. If that's the case, then if we did get the EEA deal, we should expect a pretty good recovery in the stock market. Um, I don't know if it would get, get us all the way back to, to where we were, but I think that we could probably expect that it will get us some way there, especially because a lot of the uncertainty is gone. But on the other hand, if they're pricing in the potential of the EEA option happening and we don't get that, then we could see something much worse happening and a much bigger, a, a bigger drop again um, to the stock market. Um, so, so that's, I think, something to uh, kind of worry about. Um, the, 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 real, the real key is to be kind of clear to markets, I think, that there is a plan and it's a plan that both parties will accept because but people, quite influential people, the French finance minister has already kind of said that he would be okay with the, with the EEA deal. Uh, the German finance minister um, is, seems a little bit more quite a lot more actually um, reluctant to do this. But who know? we really don't know where the, how the kind of negotiations are going to go. What the UK, I think, should do is say pretty soon, this is what we want and this is what we're going to try and get and then put the ball in the EU's court. Because if they say that and come out and say, this is what we want and markets recover, and then the EU says, oh, we're not so sure about that and markets fall, that's going to make those governments look bad to their people. And um, there, I think, the UK begins to have a bit more leverage. So... You mentioned that uh, the European Union m- is maybe reluctant to give a good deal to the UK because that could lead other countries to say, oh, well, you know, if we leave, then we'll get a good deal. So um, I guess I want you to comment on the possibility of a kind of domino effect, many countries leaving the U- uh, the EU. And, and also, I guess, uh, you know, within the UK, you might see, um, I've, I've heard people are calling for reunifying Northern and Southern Ireland. Sure, sure. So um, on the Southern Ireland, Northern Ireland thing, I think it's pretty unlikely um, that that will happen. In fact, um, the Irish Prime Minister has already sort of said he, he doesn't want to see that happen. And it's, it's Irish government, the Republic of Ireland's um, p- policy kind of to not push for reunification with um, the, the, the South and the North. So I think that's unlikely to happen. Um, I think the much, much bigger issue for the UK domestically is Scotland, because Scotland voted by a pretty hefty margin to stay in the EU um, by about 63%, 63% to 37%, I think, was the margin. Um, and the Scottish the Scottish kind of government, we have a semi-federal system here now. The Scottish government is led by nationalists who would like to, they held the independence referendum back in 2014 and they'd like an excuse to hold a referendum again. And this seems to be that excuse. So I think that's a very, very important issue. And it's very possible. You know, a lot of Scots that I'm talking to on both sides, left and right, um, who are unionists are very, very worried about this. And the, the Scots I know who are nationalists are very excited about this because they think this is sort of this is a way of reframing the entire referendum, um, the the entire independence issue as being about economic safety and saying to people who last time voted to stay in the UK that if you stay in the UK you are going to get a very very dangerous economic situation and the safest thing is to vote to leave Scotland leave the UK as Scotland and then ask to join the EU. In terms of the domino effect. 
um, I, I think it's a very, very important point. It's a very interesting point because we know that there are very um, dangerous politicians. In, I mean, uh, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front in France, uh, it has, has been over, over the moon about Brexit. And she has sort of called for a French referendum and so on. And she's possibly going to be the runner up. I don't think she's going to win the French, French presidential election, but she may very well come second. Um, in the Netherlands, there's probably a majority of people support when they're asked a referendum. And the Dutch, uh, excuse me, the Danish and the Swedes, the Czechs, the Hungarians, all of them are feeling very, very antsy about the EU at the moment and would consider leaving, I think, if they could. So for the EU, it's a question of, number one, we, we must not make this so good for the UK that everybody else leaves. Number two, we can't make it so bad for the UK that they feel like if they don't leave now, then they're going to be trapped forever. It's th This idea of the EU as a prison is very important. And this is, I think, something that we haven't really considered that much. If they're, if they're really, really punitive to the UK, then people in the Netherlands may just think, well, God, I really, I need to, we need to get out of this. This is, this is not a healthy place to be. Um, it's possible, though, that what ends up happening is that the EU reforms internally and then gives uh, in a way that would be acceptable to the UK, um, to, for example, things to do with freedom of movement, giving national governments more power to deport people who have been unemployed for a while or something like that, and then gives the UK that same deal so that the UK can accept a deal, but also that countries like the Netherlands that are concerned about immigration don't have any reason to leave. It's already baked into the EU. So I, I th I'm pretty sure that if I was in Brussels right now, my, if, I was in the Euro if I worked for the European Union, I would be more concerned with how do we reform the EU to not let this happen again, uh, rather than how do we punish the UK to try and keep these countries in. Yeah. Oh, you you uh, mentioned uh, dangerous politicians. In many ways, the... Uh at least economically, the what is it? It's been eight years since uh, the 2008 financial crisis, and in many ways, it's been a lot like the 1930s. But one way we'd really like it not to be like the 1930s is to see nationalist movements rising up across Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> it's it's it, it's really astonishing. I mean, we talk about uh, Marine Le Pen, who I mentioned in France, um, Gert Wilders, who is a sort of Dutch populist um, who, who's who, I, I we probably don't have time to go into the kind of finer details, finer differences between these politicians. There's then UKIP in the UK, who I th we need to be clear are not quite as bad. They're not in the same league um, of racism, for example. As um, although I, I think they they can they can stray into that territory. They're not they're not as bad as the National Front. But but when you look at a place like Greece, where um, the, the third or the third party, I believe, or the fourth party, certainly in c approaching ten percent of the vote, is not just a far right party, but a Nazi party. You know, this is uh, Golden Dawn, which is which is literally they have people dressed up as stor as as sort of stormtroopers. Uh, they have a, an emblem that looks like the swastika. You know, this is an openly Nazi party, and it and it's a, and they beat up members of other parties on the streets. They kind of attack rallies and so on, and they they're approaching ten percent of the vote in Greece. It's it's. It's astonishing. And then on the left, you have Podemos um, in Spain, who um, may very well lead the next government, which is and which is kind of a, a quasi-communist party. Um, you, you have Syriza in Greece again, which is a was a far left party, and it's a very very um, difficult and dangerous sort of situation. Um, the on the economics of it. I mean, I, I am of the view that the euro is responsible for many of the, these countries' problems. Um, I, I believe that money has been too tight for a very long time and that um, the kind of central management of, of money in that way uh, has backfired very badly. Um, I have a, I think, pretty unpopular view among um, kind of free market libertarians in the UK anyway, um, that the first best solution, that which they agree with, is to get rid of the euro and to just bring back national currencies. But the second best solution, if you have the euro, is to begin to kind of centralize fiscal policy as well. I think that um, that's probably what the European Union will have to do to make the euro work. And that means much, much less domestic control over taxing, spending, um, uh, things like that. And that really does mean the beginning of a European superstate. I, I don't particularly like the idea of that, but 
uh, if they are not going to drop the euro, then I don't see any other way. Right. So I guess the way people uh, talk about that, the the Greeks uh, when back when they had the drachma, you know, they could they could run up big debts, they could uh, get in a bad recession, but then they could sort of inflate their way, cushion the blow yeah. with inflation. But under yeah. the euro, they can't do that. Uh, yeah, and and the idea was that the euro will stop them from from doing all that bad stuff in the first place. They would, you know, the euro because they wouldn't be able to inflate uh, inflate their way out and so on. The euro would sort of stop them from um, borrowing money so heavily, um, and and that would be great. Um, that that hasn't been what's happened. And um, to kind of add insult to to, to add to that, uh, it hasn't just been about a lack of, um, in my opinion, a lack of. Uh, kind of domestic ability to sort of inflate your way out. It's been actually mismanagement by the by the European Central Bank. I think that they um, raised rates. They, they raised rates when um, in 2011, when an oil spike raised inflation. Um, they kind of took that to mean that money was too easy. Um, I'm more of a kind of market monetarist, like somebody like Scott Sumner. Um, and I think that you should probably look, try and see through commodity inflation and, and try and look at nominal GDP. And if you look at nominal GDP, which is just kind of total spending and so on, um, money has been very tight in the European, uh, in the Eurozone for a very long time. And, um, a, a market monetarist, um, and somebody like Milton Friedman, uh, who was, wasn't exactly a market monetarist, but was not that far away, um, would probably say that if the European Central Bank had just kept the uh, kept nominal GDP, nominal spending growing at a fairly steady click, clip um, since 2008, then probably a lot of the problems that the Eurozone is having right now wouldn't have occurred. Um, so I don't, think the Euro, I don't think the Euro necessarily can't work. Um, I think that the fact that it's dominated by Germans who are kind of inflation phobic means that it hasn't worked and it probably won't work without fiscal policy um, kind of offsetting some of the problems with it it's almost like there's a sort of cultural um aversion <laughs> since the since the 1920s hyperinflation absolutely yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's understandable of course and you know there's there's another way of looking at this as well which is that the, the ecb um has done quite well for germany you know germany's had a very good um 10 years or so um and maybe the Germans think, well, you know, we're doing okay. Um, we all these peripheral countries are kind of being forced to reform their economies in a in a kind of more market friendly way. Um, so you know that 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 works. That's okay. Um, the other kind of thing about the European single market, just to kind of go back to that, is that even though in theory it's a completely um, kind of harmonised market, in practice, uh, manufacturing goods. Um, have a much, much easier time of being sold overseas uh, within the single market than services does. And the, the German economy is much more dependent on manufacturing than the French or the, the British economies, which are much more services dependent. So in many respects, the EU is sort of built for the German economy and everything else has, uh, everybody else is sort of in, in the UK's case because we're a services economy rather than a manufacturing economy. In Greece's case, because they probably could do with a bit of inflation, um, rather than the the system we have now, in many respects, it's just these kind of other countries are suffering because they're not like Germany. And and yet the uh, the United States does well with fifty very different states under the same uh, currency and fiscal union. Um, so you know why? Uh, what is it about the United States versus Europe that makes it work better in the states and well, less well in Europe? Well, I'd say it's probably fiscal union. I would say it's probably because you have those huge transfer payments um, going between states that 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 mean that kind of imbalance. And and you know, of course, there are some states who are doing much better than others, but that mean that imbalances are corrected for in some sense, in some respects, which we just don't have in the in the EU. Um, and I think that the US is probably exactly what people will be looking at now, and probably what the architects of the euro envisaged in the first place. You know, they're that they weren't they weren't stupid people. They they probably I, I I think they probably did think, okay, we're not going to be able to sell people on fiscal union, but we might be able to sell people on on monetary union. And eventually, they're going to realize that you need fiscal union to make monetary union work. 
Um, and so, you know, we could, we, we, we will kind of get these guys into a position where there's no choice but to go for fiscal union. You know, I, and, and to be, to be clear, I don't think that the architects of the EU or the architects of the Euro, um, are bad people at all. I think that the history of Europe, um, the very bloody history of Europe, particularly in the 20th century, um, has been the main motivation of, of most people, uh, who have been pro, pro Euro, pro European Union. And their main, um, motivation has always been you know we never can let this sort of war happen again and the best way to do that as is even people like uh, fa hayek have written is some kind of um federal kind of overarching supranational federal government that sort of stops war from being an option between these states do you have any uh closing thoughts about uh about the eu and the and uh where things are going i think that the the, the big danger that faces the EU right now is that people, the EU has always put politics ahead of economics, as it did with the euro. And if it continues to do that, then what it will do is give the UK a bad deal that probably ends up spooking uh, the Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Denmark, who then will probably want to leave themselves. And what happens then is that Germany is left in a fairly deep political union with countries that it really would not like to be alone with. Countries like Italy, Spain, Greece, and a lot of the Eastern European countries, which do not share the same broadly pro-market outlook that Germany, that Germany has and don't have the kind of deep liberal tradition that country, that the sort of Northern and Western European countries have. And this is the, the real kind of concern, I think, that, of mine. Um, there is a brighter and more hopeful option this this kind of idea of a of a single market economic integration without economic pol- political integration i think is a very live issue it's something that we very mel- way, very well may get and if it works for the uk you might also get countries these countries leaving and choosing that but that doesn't have to be a bad thing for the for the eu if they accept really that you know a lot of people don't share this this kind of German ambition, French ambition for a single United States of Europe. Where can people find you online? Um, I blog and uh, run the Adam Smith Institute, uh, which is uh, adamsmith.org. And I tweet a lot at uh, S8, the number 8, M-B. S8, M-B. Okay. Yeah. Sam, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thank you. You can head on over to economicsdetective.com slash Brexit to learn more about this episode and about my guest. If this is your first time listening to Economics Detective Radio, I urge you to subscribe through iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast app is. Just search Economics Detective and you can subscribe so you'll know right away when I release a new episode. If you want to support the show, you can head on over to economicsdetective.com slash support, where you'll find a link to my Patreon page, among other things. Uh, Patreon allows you to make small recurring donations to the content creators like me, who produce free content for you to consume. You, you notice how there was no irritating advertisement for, for socks or something in the middle of that interview and the only reason I can do that is because some people have chosen to be generous and support me and pay a small recurring amount for each episode I make really encourages me so thanks to the people who do that and if you want to be a person who does that or someone who helps out maybe in another way like perhaps writing me a review on iTunes head on over to economicsdetective.com support thanks for listening Thank you.